Welcome everyone. So excited that you can join us. My name is Dr. Healy Gardner and I'm a psychologist working at the Center for Psychology and Emotion Regulation. And it is my absolute pleasure to be your moderator this evening in a very exciting conversation, a very timely and important conversation about talking about weight. So our conversations about weight, good for your health. And um, I am joined by my two lovely colleagues, Anne Williams and Charlotte Laws. I will give much more um, gushing introductions to in a moment. <laughs> but um, like I said, this is a very important topic. We live in a world where we're surrounded with messages about our health, what it means to be healthy. This is healthy. No, this is healthy. Do this. Don't do this and they're ever changing. And also messages about food supply, what to eat, what not to eat. And um, of course, related to all of that, messages about weight. And of course, parents, loved ones, this is a very important topic. And healthcare practitioners may have legitimate concern. So, and you know, feeling that it's important to warn children and warn clients about maybe the possibilities of your weight and how that may or may not impact your health. And in doing so, a lot of times well-intentioned, well-meaningly, they may also link advice. So behavioral advice on what to do activity-wise, what to eat. Um, and nine times out of 10, very good intentions, very well-meaning intentions. However, what are the actual implications of talking about weight, of focusing on weight, especially as it relates to our health? And more importantly, I suppose, is it even an effective strategy to try and promote that there is a normal weight? So those are the main things we'll be focusing on tonight. And to help us with this, like I said, I have two lovely colleagues with me. So Anne Williams received her Bachelor of Applied Science in Nutrition from the University of Guelph and pursued her graduate clinical internship at Sunnybrook Health Sciences. She was privileged to work for 11 years with clients experiencing kidney failure and dialysis in Oshawa, Oakville, and Mississauga. She has practiced as a dietitian in the eating disorders field specifically for 20 years, 17 of these as a team member at the Eating Disorders Clinic in St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Anne has enjoyed seeing clients and leading groups in primary care with the Hamilton Family Health Team. This led to an interest in mentoring primary care registered dietitians regarding weight and neutral care and disordered eating and eating disorders. Now in recent years, Anne has also enjoyed facilitating nutri nutrition groups and culinary nutrition groups for individuals experiencing cancer and other health challenges. She is excited to be working with a team developing programming for eating disorders prevention in Ontario. Anne's passion is translating nutrition, health and weight science into weight neutral, equitable, fun and approachable language. Now on to Charlotte Laws. Originally from the UK, Charlotte brings a wealth of experience in various treatment models. She learned her MSc in applied psychology through the University of Liverpool, UK, a postgraduate certificate in addictions, treatment and prevention from Georgian College, and an HBA FB degree from Lakehead University, Aurelia, with a joint major in psychology. Charlotte has worked in a wide range of mental health and addiction work settings. She currently has a specific interest in working with those struggling with binge eating disorder and or those who are considering having or have had bariatric surgery. She also specializes in working with the LGBTQS, 2SQ plus population, my apologies, along with those experiencing issues with chronic illness. She works from a very client-centered, holistic, 
health at every size approach and strives to provide a safe, non judgmental space for those needing support. So suffice it to say, they are two very established people, and I couldn't ask for anyone better to do this webinar with. Just so you know, there is a Q&A where you're welcome to put any questions in the chat. We are going to be aiming to spend 10 to 15 minutes at the end aside for any questions. Um, just planning ahead, if there are an abundance of questions, uh, we're going to try and pick the most general ones that can be the most wide reaching. The idea here is this is a large topic, so we just want to, you know, start the conversation. So um, picking the questions that might most suit us to be able to do that. Okay, now let's jump in. So first, uh, Anne, turning it over to you, you want to start this conversation talking about weight bias, especially in our culture. So why do you think this is an important place to start? Thank you, Healy, and thank you for that introduction and even, you know, your conversation at the start, I feel like just the way you sort of presented those questions, it kind of made us all pause and think and kind of feel like you've uh, started off really well, so thank you. And it is a privilege to be co-presenting with Charlotte. Um, never met Charlotte in person, but we've sort of uh, been together in meetings and sort of practiced together a little bit, and I really respect her passion for this area. So starting off sometimes, so I do a fair amount of teaching and, and about sort of weight science and weight bias and sort of weight affirming or mutual care. And I don't always start off talking about weight bias, but I thought it really makes sense to start talking about weight bias. And before I go further, I want to acknowledge that even sort of for you to be sitting in this conversation as a participant, um, it may feel uncomfortable. You know, weight is just packed with so much because we live in a weight biased world. So um, we're going to do our best to not be stigmatizing, uh, to not be triggering. Um, please take care of yourself as you listen. And if it doesn't feel comfortable, you know, if you if you actually feel like um, leaving the session, we will not be offended. Maybe throw something in the chat to Healy and just let her know. Um, um, and I guess the reason. Um, and if I use the term obesity, because it also is packed with some sort of history of stigma, um, you know, it isn't always used in a in a uh, a good way, even in healthcare. I will use that term sparingly and try not to use it unless I'm referring to it. Okay, so I am going to share the screen, and hopefully, it's going to work. Um, I am definitely, you know, what I think that I'm going to go here. I forgot. I should have. Um, I'm going to put this on slideshow quickly. Thank you for your patience. Oops. I'll try one more time. Using the slideshow. Okay. Oh, all right. We're just going to go back then. Try this. With someone of my generation, there's always a glitch with slides. So that was your entertainment for uh, hopefully the most of your entertainment for the evening. So we're not going to use slides. We're going to try and make it a conversation. But we thought this is useful to, to put up on, um, have a few slides about this. So, you know, if we think about sort of distinguishing the definitions of bias, stigma, and discrimination. So bias would be those negative attitudes towards and beliefs about others because of weight. And research shows that just like other implicit and unconscious biases, most of us in this culture have bias. And for some of us, it's conscious, we're aware, um, and there's also unconscious bias. And then weight stigma would be just a titch different in that it's that negative label that's affixed, affixed to high weight that leads to social devaluation of high weight individuals. And so, you know, we could go, you can probably think of a few uh, sort of labels and stigmas that are attached to those living in larger bodies. And I won't even list them because that can feel stigmatizing, but you know, we can think about that both in um, public sphere, in healthcare, et cetera. And then discrimination is something that I talk about a lot because I'm often talking to healthcare practitioners. It's any behavior involving unjust treatment of an individual based on their weight. Now, the interesting thing is that bias, stigma, and discrimination are highly prevalent in our society. You know, I'll give you a couple examples of discrimination. 
Um, it might even be sort of in employment practices that, you know, um, people are chosen sort of or not chosen based on their appearance and weight. Or in healthcare, things like um, having a scale out in a public setting. And maybe it's even a scale in the waiting room that doesn't accurately measure at higher weight. Um, or very commonly, blood pressure cuffs. Um, after a certain, you know, for someone in a larger body, it may not fit properly or measure properly. So, um, say in a medical setting, not having sort of different size blood pressure cuffs. Those are just small examples, and we could list more. Um, and then sort of bias and stigma can be sort of communicated in different ways, right, in how we communicate. But it's uh, been measured. Pearl is one of the researchers that researches it. Um, and it's considered highly prevalent in our society in employment settings, relationships, school settings, um, and in healthcare, it sort of has remained highly prevalent and stable over the last few decades, which is unfortunate. I'm just going to. So, and I, I guess why we talk about it, it, it is the air we breathe. It's the, the ocean we swim in and kind of expecting to not take any of it in is like expecting a fish not to take in any water. So not sort of judging ourselves when we realize that we have these biases. It's, it's sort of surrounding us all the time, and especially with social media. And so I guess my um, sort of thought for you to sort of um, digest would be, we start off think, talking about weight, um, you know, should we be talking about it? And, you know, are people healthy if they're at a higher weight? We have to remember that whenever we're talking about this, it's in the context of weight bias. And so even those of us in healthcare, Sometimes our practices are more informed by our inherent weight bias and by the culture we live in than they are by um, the science. And I would say that myself, you know, even I still sort of continue to fight that to this day. And if we think about equity and social justice, then this is just like, if I go back to this, sort of trying to fight this in ourselves and protect people is just like sort of fighting judgment and discrimination in any other area like race or gender identity or sexual orientation or age or substance use um, or poverty. And sort of there are lots of these other areas where we have, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion policies um, that really encourage us to examine structural as well as our own behavioral approaches. And um, when it comes to school bullying policies, for example, the national discussion document doesn't include appearance and weight in something to be considered around bullying. And most of our own workplaces, this is something you could sort of change the conversation, go back and look at your own equity, diversion, inclusion policies at your workplace, and they're unlikely to protect based on weight-based or appearance-based discrimination. So I guess I just want to plant the seed that weight bias is the norm. Um, weight discrimination is the norm for people living in larger bodies. If I see someone in my practice or any, any of my work settings, people in larger bodies and even um, in sort of straight size bodies will talk. It's the norm to have experiences of weight based discrimination in life and in healthcare. It's baked in. Um, and so the effects, um, I'm going to just go ahead a little bit. So this is a quote, I'll just read that second sort of, I already alluded to it, another researcher, and this was 10, 13 years ago, and it's still, you could say the same thing, despite decades of science documenting weight stigma, its public health implications are widely ignored. And then we go on to blame people, we think that using blame will actually motivate them. And if we understand psychology, we know that's not the case. And then also the idea that weight stigma has both psychological and physiological physical effects on our health independently. I'll just show you this quote. So again, these guidelines, the Canadian Obesity Clinical Practice Guidelines published in 2020, I don't agree with all the conclusions uh, reached, but the second point in their five summary points in their executive summary is that people living with obesity experience pervasive weight bias and stigma, which contributes independent of weight or BMI to increased morbidity or illness and mortality. Pretty strong statement. And, you know, um, and again, um, sort of weight researchers and people from the eating disorder world, we don't always agree on conclusions, but it's really interesting to see that there is agreement about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing.
Keely, were you jumping in? I was about to, yeah, perfect. Excellent timing there. So (laughs) it sounds like there's absolutely a strong impact of weight bias. And if we look even beyond the negative effects, the existence of weight bias, weight stigma, weight discrimination, what about the idea that health can be improved by addressing weight, body weight, shape, controlling that? Um, What about the idea that if someone's trying to improve their health or like a doctor helping someone else to do so, going about that by focusing on weight loss as like the primary outcome, the desired outcome, is it as helpful as we think? It's a good question. And, you know, in your introduction, I think the participants might have concluded that Um, Charlotte and I are both kind of passionate about this and we might have our own bias, right? Because we have worked, I have worked with people in larger bodies, people with all eating disorders for so long um, that it's hard for me not to see the risk of harm, right? Um, So, you know, I will admit that I may have a bias, but I also work with people with heart disease in their middle age phase of life and with cancer survivors. And of course, I want them to be as healthy as possible. So it would be irresponsible if I thought it was the best thing to focus on weight. I think focusing on weight, um, it's the, uh, the question would be sort of three or fourfold. So firstly, focusing on weight can perpetuate weight stigma, right? Like it's like we're perpetuating it in both in ourselves um, and in the other person. And when we internalize weight stigma, uh, we know that can affect our health, both physically and psychologically. And, you know, again, I think it's a social justice issue to be treating everyone the same. But beyond that, there is, you know, risk of harm. And this is, again, where us, those of us working in the eating disorders field, and those work researching weight, we might sort of have different views of the risk of harm. But the risk of harm would be especially for youth, disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, and so that, you know, I think for parents, teachers, like really keeping that in mind that it's not, even if we think that weight is linked with health, Um, focusing on weight does carry a risk of harm in that regard. Also carries a risk of weight cycling because weight is actually really hard to keep off. And I'll talk about that um, in in a sec a little bit more. And then for those of us, especially who might be living in larger bodies, there's two risks that I think about a lot, even if it doesn't create an eating disorder. It's the idea of, because of weight stigma, that if weight is focused on in say the doctor's office, Often we have we have documentation that people avoid healthcare, so they start to just not go back, and so that actually decreases their health, right, in the long run. And and again, I have seen this over and over working in different settings. The other thing that can happen, again, which I've seen, and you know, people may connect with, um, I've seen it personally as well, is people may start being active, may start going to a gym or engaging in something, and then when weight doesn't come off. Or they may make dietary changes or other lifestyle changes. And then if weight doesn't come off, it's like, well, that didn't help. So the health, those um, health practices are abandoned. And that would be really unfortunate. So those are two ones. And then I guess the other thing, and people are surprised, I, maybe the people in this room won't be, but weight is actually not the most important factor linked with health that predicts health. There are so many other factors that are linked with health for a lifetime and lower risk of disease that can be undertaken and they will have that effect whether or not we lose weight. And so when we hear about the Mediterranean diet or the effects of physical activity or the effects of fiber or fruits and vegetables, those are all findings that have been found independent of weight loss. And arguably they're you know more sustainable than weight loss. And I'll talk about it again. Um, So I will just list off some of the other factors. So social determinants of health, which is huge and a lot of us don't talk about. So education, poverty, employment, access to health care, living environment, trauma, those kind of things can affect our health. Sleep, stress, being in nature. So Healy talked about getting outside today. Um, Many dietary things, physical activity, uh, smoking, alcohol, and social connectedness. Those are sort of biggies that have a good body of literature and all of those have effects regardless of whether we lose weight. Finally, the the fourth point is that it is actually biological in us, in our DNA, it probably has to do with evolution. And those who research weight might see this as a disease or a, a problem. And it's also what has kept us alive as humans is that the body will resist weight loss over time. So that 
It is actually agreed upon among those who research weight that keeping weight off um, in the long term beyond two, three, four years is uncommon for most people. And again, I would love people to just actually hear that from family physicians. And then it's still your choice, right? But informed consent, sort of minus the weight bias, and then focus on those, those other things, regardless of what happens with weight. Just gonna show a couple of quick quotes and I'm probably getting close to my time for this one. So I'm gonna go back to my slideshow and I'll just show you a couple of quotes. Um, okay. Oh, this was, this is, I'm gonna go ahead. There, I, I kind of had my slides out of order. So this is a quote from Australian guidelines published in 2018 and I like their conclusions a little bit better. Look at what they say, and every document will say this in different ways, but it's an obesity document. Sustained weight loss is uncommon. This is in an obesity document. And failed weight loss attempts have negative psychological and physical effects. So that idea of weight cycling, which most people engage in when the weight comes on, it can affect cholesterol, insulin resistance, um, risk of diabetes, other things. So it's not innocuous. And then it goes on to state that we should focus on optimizing health, regardless of weight and fighting stigma. And I would, I would totally agree with that, um, that conclusion. So I'll stop sharing there for a second. So I think those are, I mean, that was said very, very briefly. And I think why don't those things that I listed, you know, we've all heard of them, but why don't they get the attention in, you know, in a healthcare appointment, when we talk about health in schools, even when parents are thinking of their children's health. And I think it's, again, we're informed by weight bias in our culture. I also think sometimes it's because it's not as flashy. It's, it's not as quick of a fix. And if we're healthier, but we don't look different, that can be really hard to accept in a world that completely judges our worth and our health by how we look. Um, and so I would just sort of present that as, as reasons to consider maybe not talking about weight, but just talking about feeling good and talking about health behaviors and thinking about even helping change people's environments, which, you know, that uh, makes me sound maybe really touchy feely, but wouldn't that be wonderful, you know, living wages and all those kind of things, but we won't get too political. On this. <laughs> I love the sunshine comment. I saw the sun today for the first time in like a yeah. week and man, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's sounding like the moral of the story is also you know the world ain't that simple nothing's that simple that by just changing weights you're if if weight goes down health goes up or vice versa and you know i can understand why it would be nice if everything was that simple and the truth is it's not and the the truth is if you can embrace the complexity that actually gives you so many other options like going outside connecting with other people mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know connecting with things that you value so yeah. finding you, skills to manage stress. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it wonderful having a therapist do this, uh, this facilitation and someone who's bought into these concepts? <laughs> I'm glad I could help. And I can also <laughs> always recommend petting a dog, which yeah. I'm very biased, but I recommend it. So you've talked about this a bit already, but can you tell us a bit more about some factors that can contribute to our weight? Because it's sounding like it's not a willpower thing. It's not a calories in, calories out situation. It's a lot more complicated than that. It is. And this could be a whole talk. So I'm just going to show one slide, which I already threw up, you know, because that's me. Um, I'll show one slide and then just, uh, yeah, it's food for thought that again, often we think a person's weight is, yeah, willpower. It's what they've eaten over a lifetime, how active they've been. Maybe if we're, you know, a little bit more educated, we might think, oh, maybe it's some medication, but we really don't realize how complex and those who research weight um, realize. So the UK obesity guidelines, which I haven't got, um, uh, I won't show, I'm just gonna share the screen again. Um, they would talk about over 100 factors. This is um, a visual, it's, a little, it's from 2015, uh, it was published. And at the time, these are factors that had some research suggesting their role in predicting weight or, or energy storage or weight gain. Um, and the reason I chose it is not because I'm gonna read off every factor, but because visually sit back and look at how many factors are on. 
And it also doesn't, I just want to give a disclaimer, it doesn't mean that every factor listed here is thought to have the same rule. Um, those who research weight would, would say that between 50 and 75% of our weight is sort of predicted genetically. And some of these are potentially uh, predicted genetically. But, you know, I'm going to read off a few. So low socioeconomic status, um, living in crime-prone areas, maternal stress, birth by C-section. And of course, these may not all have the same role. On the other side, more internal gut microbes, pain sensitivity, physical disability, um, endocrine dysregulation. And so Charlotte may talk about this more, but people with PCOS or thyroid dysfunction or insulin resistance. And so it's just so much more complicated. And again, if we can understand complexity, it may mean that because weight is so complex, maybe we don't you know, need to be scaring people about you need to do this or this behavior because it will make you gain weight. Maybe just valuing those behaviors because of how we feel, um, but not making this the end game because, and what the Canadian guidelines, um, Canadian obesity guidelines would say, is that the predict for everybody who lives in a larger body, um, the sort of the mix of these factors is unique and individual and complex. Um, and so it's just way more complicated. So again, potentially another reason to sort of not talk about it because of the risk of harm, but because it's way more complex than most of us realize. I just realized I should have probably kept screen sharing. In conclusion, are you guys okay for my section? And I'm just looking at time here. Um, are you okay if I show the Poodle Science video? It's a couple of um, minutes. Yeah. And I think it's a nice summary um, of all of these concepts. It's a metaphor though. So realize that metaphors are never um, quite as simple as, you know, it's probably a little more complex than metaphor. But we will do this. We'll see if I can pull off uh, the video. And we're, we're expecting that I can because we're just being positive. Okay, so here we go. Tell me, uh, give me a thumbs up, Ely, if you hear it, okay? There's a big problem at the center of our research on weight and health. What's the problem? Well, picture a society made up of dogs. Let's say poodles are the bossiest group. They're the ones you see down at the doggy park barking at all the other dogs about how to live their lives in order to be healthy. But the problem is, poodles think that every other kind of dog is just a really big, a really small, or a really fat poodle, when actually the other dogs aren't even poodles at all. They're terriers, or mastiffs, or greyhounds, or labs. And all of the thousands of different dog breeds have different lifespans and different health risks. Each one has evolved to use food differently for different specialties at surviving, some for staying warm, some for running fast, and some for being strong. They're meant to be different sizes and weights. So the poodles think the mastiff should lose weight, but a starving mastiff never becomes a poodle. The poodles don't understand that dogs come in many more sizes than they can imagine in their poodle-centric ways. So this becomes a problem when it comes to poodle science. When the poodles did their weight and health research and made the claim that lighter dogs are healthier and live longer, they weren't comparing thinner poodles and fatter poodles. They were comparing poodles and mastiffs. So the recommendation for mastiffs to lose weight is based on the false assumption that if all dogs reach poodle weight, then all dogs will have poodle health. But once again, a starved mastiff just isn't a poodle. This poodle science doesn't even test whether a starved mastiff lives longer than a mastiff who has enough to eat, because one would have to compare mastiffs who maintain poodle weight to mastiffs that maintain mastiff weight. And it turns out that starving mastiffs regain weight, which after all is a much better thing than starving. But the poodles can only see that regain as a failure of mastiff self-discipline. Look, poodles are great, but poodle-centric health policy is a nightmare. Good science tells us that it's better to recognize and respect the ways we're different, because how we're treated, having good friends, having access to decent food, a place to play, restful sleep, and medical care make a huge difference in our health and longevity for all of us, whatever our size.
So I love it. Yeah. Is that the first time you've seen it, Haley? Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, I think it's great for all of us because it's kind of, it just gets us out of our heads a bit. Um, I also think it's not a bad one for kids and teens, right? If they've been at school and they've heard stuff. So hopefully that's food for thought. It's easy to find that video. It's called Poodle Science. I think it's on YouTube if you ever want to use it. All right, well, I'm gonna sort of uh, turn it over to you and Charlotte now for a while. Awesome. I love it. And not just cause it was about dogs, but he's really- It does cute. make it better though, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly you're seeing one of my biases. All right, so turning it over to Charlotte. So. You're very concerned with how cultural weight bias feeds that that idea of diet culture in all of its iterations and forms. So can you tell us a bit more about what you've actually observed about diet culture? Well, I think Anne sort of, you know, has done a pretty thorough job of, of mentioning how ingrained and entrenched it is from the moment that we are born. Um, you know, I, I can speak of numerous people who have told me stories of, you know, going to Weight Watchers at like age 10, 9, 10, 11, 12 with their, their mothers and then their, their grandmothers went to, you know, Weight Watchers before them and, and, and that's kind of started a long history of, uh, you know, of uh, dieting um, kind of behaviors and I think you know Anne and I were talking the other day about you know I think there was a, a statistic about the average number of diets that someone will go through in their life by the time they hit sort of middle age and for women it was sort of the average was around 60 diets so you know give or take a few I mean that's that's an awful lot of um, diets in, in in that amount of time and I think speaking to what Anne was saying you know when we weigh up the costs and the benefits of things you know, when we think about fast intentional weight loss and, and that can have some negative health, you know, impacts, if that was like a one-time thing, you know, and then we were like, okay, we're done now, you know, maybe the, the benefit would outweigh the risk. But when, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, people kind of cycle and cycle and cycle, then then we kind of have to ask the question is, is it kind of working, you know? Um, and And in terms of our history, you know, standards in terms of body shape and size have changed you know I always joke that I should have been born in the renaissance period because then I would have been seen as like you know affluent and you know fertile and you know all that kind of stuff uh but you know obviously in in our modern time I was born in the 90s and you know that was the time of the heroin chic and uh, models walking around in very anorexic kind of states um and also time where you know you think about friends and and other kind of shows like that you know there was a lot of fat jokes happening in in media and it's kind of sort of carried on on from there um but you know it's it's very fixated on how we look and we make assumptions about how we look and and how that relates to our health um whereas you know obviously i'm sure Anne and i can both speak to you know examples of where that's not completely true so for instance you know i've had you know, clients with things like anorexia, you know, who are very low weight, who have been congratulated and told that they look really great, um, or people with cancer who have lost weight unintentionally be congratulated, asked what their secret is, all this kind of stuff, you know, but actually they're not very healthy. Um, and then on the other hand, obviously the assumption that if you're a bigger body, that means that, you know, you're automatically unhealthy. Um, whereas, like Anne sort of said, you know, there's a lot of different factors. And I think we need to sort of critically question sometimes where we're getting information from, because we can't kind of separate hustle culture, which is based in capitalism, and diet culture. Because, you know, we live in a world where we are all running on empty you know, for the benefit of shareholders and companies and things like that, not for our own health. And I'm seeing a lot of burnout and a lot of like very stressed people. Um, but in combination with that, you know, we've got um, a society that kind of puts the onus on the individual. You just need to try harder, work harder. Otherwise, you're not valuable and you're you're basically doing something wrong. But like Anne said, there's a lot of like environmental factors that kind of go into our well-being. And, uh, you know, basically these companies kind of feed off of our insecurities, you know, and, and the issues we have around our time and how tired we are 
and and that kind of thing so they they've kind of built a system where they've kind of created a bit of a problem and they found the solution to fix that problem supposedly um through basically diet plans um cosmetic surgeries um all sorts of different things all these face creams for anti-aging because we're not allowed to get older and our bodies aren't allowed to change you know through pregnancy you know aging menopause all these different things um when actually it's a normal process that our our body kind of goes through you know and, and even with this new kind of wave of you know and again I'd never ever ever want to judge anyone who has weight loss surgeries or anything like that I myself have had a lap band and I had it taken out a number of years ago for, for complications but I fully get the pressure of dieting and um you know having these procedures but you know um, when we talk about informed consent it's kind of a little bit of a contradiction to me in terms of people are denied weight um you know sort of surgeries based on the BMI but then when it comes to weight loss surgery it's very very quickly encouraged and I feel like at times I know for myself I was not given the information about some of the you know consequences of having these these kind of weight loss surgeries you know and how complicated those could be in the same way maybe I would have got in other types of surgery and and just sort of the double standard there so I think we just need to you know again in terms of informed consent if people want to make those decisions absolutely that is your choice your body but you know I think again bias kind of creeps in sometimes when we're giving out that information so um and paying attention also to like like Anne was saying in terms of the fitness industry that kind of feeds into it as well you know just uh you know cut your calories and work out more but also you know people are judged when they go to the gym and then they don't go to the gym and then they get judged for not going and exercising <laughs> so we, we, we kind of go into a bit of a cyclical kind of effect so it's it's just basically around um you know unrealistic expectations of people I think and recognizing that you know we ourselves have to kind of start to sort of realize that you know we can do things for our health um and and recognize that you know we're in a really hard environment to do those things so but something is better than than nothing kind of thing yeah absolutely and like you said it we're, we're definitely not here to judge anyone for their actions no. or for their desires or for what they will do in the future have done in the past or doing now and I love your point about informed consent because I think that's what it boils down to. If someone truly, really knows all the information from all the sides, then that's one thing. And often there's a lot of information missing. Like, who's the players behind all these diet commercials? Like, who's actually making money? Who's benefiting? What's the true motivator? And ultimately, we, um, Anne brought this up a few minutes ago, but the idea of like some of the more um, significant consequences, not to say that any are less valid. And when we're talking about potential impacts of developing eating disorders or like like long term um, difficulties with your relationship with food and your body, Charlotte, you have worked with a lot of clients affected by diet culture and eating disorders of all kinds and all body sizes. So to that note, can you tell us a bit about how, you know, diet culture and eating disorders intermingle? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, obviously, you know, the development of eating disorders is quite complex. You know, there, there are some of us who are more biologically predisposed to developing an eating disorder. Um, and in terms of like, I come from an, an addictions background, you know, and we talk about sort of um, process addictions, which are addictions that you can't give up. And I would classify an eating disorder as, as being in that realm. And of course, it's a coping strategy. And when you think about, you know, our relationship with food when we're younger especially like we don't have a lot of coping strategies when there's sort of very stressful things happening around us but food is that thing that's like always there whether it's we restrict it and we we stop ourselves from eating because it's sort of a sense of control that way or whether we use it as a comfort and then you know it kind of goes from there you know a lot of people will say it's sort of like a you know when they feel lonely it's that kind of constant sort of there that they know is there but the problem with it is, is we also have kind of a very mixed messaging when it comes to food. It's sort of like, you know, here's, you know, here's a comfort, have a cookie because you've, you know, hurt yourself and grandma's made cookies, but don't get fat. <laughs> so it's sort of like a bit of a contradiction there. Um, but basically, that you know, there has been research to sort of say that 
um, if you diet, you know, obviously there is a higher risk of disordered eating because you are um, restricting calories very, you know, very significantly. So, you know, you think about a toddler probably needs about, you know, you know, 14, 13, 1400 calories just to function. And some of the diet plans that we are on these days for an adult is less than that. Plus you're working out and doing all these other things. So, you know, that's, that's a big issue um and then setting like good and bad foods you know that kind of mental restriction of you know demonizing foods or set or being these are ultra healthy foods but then we kind of get into a bit of trouble where you know I think Anne has a picture of this as well where we sort of get into the what we call the restrict binge cycle um so basically we'll restrict our calories um we'll do things like over exercising um, that kind of thing and then in combination with that we'll also kind of mentally restrict so label foods good or bad um, you know only allow like you look at like weight watcher plans well they'll only let you have like you can only have nine nine nuts if you have 10 nuts you know in a portion then then that's being bad you know or for instance olive oil is a good one as well like the points can be quite high but the nutritional benefits are amazing to our infl inflammation levels everything but we avoid it because of the points of, of what it could be so basically from that you know we obviously um, start to sort of get cravings for things both mentally and physically and then that leads to sort of binging behaviors and then the, the guilt and the shame kicks in I failed uh, you know I'm the problem and now I'm going to overcompensate by restricting even more the next day or over exercising or whatever else we're doing. And it's just it becomes like a really cyclical kind of um, issue. And we don't also take into account with this cycle that, you know, there are medical conditions. So, you know, if I went to my doctor and I said, you know, I've lost 30 pounds unintentionally someone would be like oh my goodness like is there something going on like do you have like a you know bowel issue cancer something else going on but when we put weight on in you know unintentionally it's sort of seen as you know we'll just try harder just just keep trying harder and as someone who has a thyroid condition and um hormonal conditions um you know I can honestly say that I wish it was that simple but but it's not you know and I think we need to pay attention to some of like the conditions that can also you know cause issues in another way um, especially menopause as well like I think the fact that bariatric surgery is highest in women at menopausal age after years and years of weight cycling through dieting then they hit menopause gain weight because of that because of hormonal changes and then go oh my goodness I'm failing I can't do anything else I'm going to have bariatric surgery I think we just have to recognize that you know obviously there's there's something going on there um, that we need to pay attention to um, and then there's just other things like I have clients with binge eating disorder for instance who um, you know there was poverty involved like there's studies to show that you know if you've had food scarcity um, you are actually at a higher risk of, of binging um, later on in life or if you have ADHD you know and you you struggle with those dopamine um, highs and lows you know you can go through periods where you don't eat and then periods where you you binge so there's lots of different um, factors that can kind of go into this but recognizing again like Anne said that you know it's you know um, more complicated and I would like to say in terms of eating disorders that a lot of myths around them having a look and you know I, it doesn't have an age they don't have a look all pop you know all populations of people um, can have eating disorders and I think you know definitely they don't have a size so you know we get people who get missed with things like atypical anorexia who um, have all the signs and symptoms and health complications that come along with starvation of themselves but they're at a higher starting body weight and so they get dismissed because they're not in that you know typical anorexia kind of low weight category um, but the, the, the health effects can be just as damaging uh, women of color are you know much more likely to be dismissed because they tend to be um, different shapes and sizes to you know white people um, and then I have a lot of trans clients that I work with and again you know there's a lot of other issues that go into why they might develop an eating disorder and trying to again even you know trying even harder to try and fit into that unrealistic body st standard um, of our time and and it's it's a bit of, it's a bit of a dangerous game I would say I don't know if Anne has anything to add to that. 
I'm just so, I, I love sort of you sharing. I feel like you fit so much into the conversation and I, I particularly, um, yeah, love you talking about different groups that are, uh, you know, at higher risk and some of them that haven't been shown to be at higher risk, but probably because we haven't studied, you know. So right now we think that mm -hmm. people of color have about the same um, prevalence of eating disorders as people, um, you know, of Caucasian background, but we probably haven't studied that enough, you know, and certainly what we know is that uh, people from some of these groups do not seek treatment as much, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because they're not identified and treated equitably. So yeah, it's a pretty complicated conversation, but I just really appreciate everything that you said, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And and I think we need to be aware of these things in, in eating disorder treatment as well, because um, like, for instance, you know, if you have someone who's uh, neurodivergent and exhibiting some issues because they, they don't like certain textures of food, things like that, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they get sort of uh, labeled as like um, not wanting to eat, you know, mm -hmm. when actually it's a texture issue or um, again, you know, uh, you're kind of giving people um, a bigger, you know, who are at higher weights, um, smaller portions in eating disorder recovery because you're afraid of them getting fat or fatter, whatever, you know, that we want to call it, you know, that that's a problem because it's not, it's reinforcing the eating disorder behavior. Mm -hmm. So this is how it can, weight bias can even creep into um, eating disorders treatment as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, it's such a complex topic, especially when talking about eating disorders, we could be here all week easily. And, um, you know, the main takeaways are a very strong relationship uh, between disordered eating, eating disorders, and the impact of diet culture, and the impact of so much focus on weight and weight bias. And, so, and I think, again, with the pandemic, I just want to say as well, like, yeah, we've seen a absolutely. real upshoot in, in eating disorders since the pandemic. And it's interesting because when we talk about hustle culture as well, there was that kind of like, well, you're home now and you should be doing something. And so, you know, this is the time to go on a diet and get that body that you want and just work out and, you know, do all this stuff. And I had a lot, we had a lot of youth, again, traumatic experience happening, maybe a predisposition as well, genetically. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in, you know, the dieting and, and that's the focus, you know, um, and working out. And we've seen, like, I'm sure Anne can speak to this as well. And you, Healy. Um, you know, huge uptick in, yeah. you know, all different eating disorders since, since mm -hmm. the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic was huge because there was such a conversation of, I don't know, bodies being ruined by, you know, the COVID-19 kind of situation. So obviously there's a ton to explore and to unpack here. And it's just a start. That was the game plan. Um, how about any like practical suggestions? Some things have been mentioned already you know, sunlight, dogs, um, throw that back in there. But any other like practical suggestions for people who want to adjust their approach about weight, thinking, behaving, talking about it? Um, I'll, I'll jump in first. Yeah. And then Charlotte, if you want to add, go for it. I think, you know, having worked in healthcare and the longer I present about this, like, whether it's parents or teachers or for loved ones or in your personal life, or in, if you're a healthcare provider, like just experiment with not talking about weight. Like it's really, it would be really okay. And, you know, maybe it will actually be better. Like really experiment with it. And you'll actually be surprised because it's a common compliment. Oh, have you lost weight? Um, but just try not talking about weight and appearance everywhere. And then, you know, if you are sort of in a position of more power as far as, you know, you're an influencer in a school setting or you're in healthcare, Think about that idea of informed consent, um, even consent to talk about weight, which is something that even the obesity guidelines talk about. Like, you know, the idea, um, maybe thinking about, I'm not going to talk about weight. It's going to be the, the last choice. I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. other things first, because most people in larger bodies, they're scared and they've been traumatized by those conversations and they don't need to be informed they're in larger bodies. And then that treating everyone equitably, equitably and giving them access to the same kind of healthcare is a social justice issue. Um, and to be exploring our biases, just like we explore our biases around race and other things. Those are my sort of, and then making our environments accessible to people in larger bodies, chairs, um, examining tables, blood pressure, cuffs, MRI machines, all of this. That's my little soapbox rant. Any additions, Charlotte? 
Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I'm a bigger body person. And again, you know, I found out a, lot, a while ago, you know, that if you have a, a blood pressure cuff that's too tight, it's going to give you a false high blood pressure reading. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are things, to, practical things to be aware of. Um, and just, you know, my, my thing is, is just, to, again, recognizing health as a, a holistic thing. When we look at the research on things like hormonal issues, menopause, you know, these things can cause changes to cholesterol levels, blood pressure issues. So again, just sort of, you know, recognizing that it's not just a, a weight, in, you know, I just love to see a more weight inclusive approach because, you know, it's one factor of like many other things that I think sometimes are, are missed. And I see a lot of clients, especially, you know, women with, with these issues that kind of, you know, are really struggling. So, um, you know, just, and just the onus, like, you know, we live in a culture that feels like if we blame and shame someone, we're somehow going to motivate them. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say, and I cannot, can any of you honestly say that when someone's shamed and blamed you, that it, that it makes you feel like more, you know, I'm going to go get this. Maybe, maybe it might for a yeah. very short period of time, you know, for some people, but for most of us, I would honestly say it does the opposite of what's intended. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just being, um, you know, kind to one another and, and recognizing that, you know, even through history, there have been bigger bodied people. It's just, you know, again, they didn't have mannequins in museums to fit bigger bodied clothing. So they just didn't keep them in the museums. So things like this. So it's just recognizing that, you know, maybe we need to critically think a bit more outside of the box sometimes and, and just sort of, you know, see if there's other kind of viewpoints out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Absolutely. And the one thing that's coming to me that I, I, I hope this is coming across and maybe I'm just anxiously want to making sure that it's out there. We're spending a lot of time also focusing on the impact of uh, talking about larger bodies in a negative light and also encouraging everyone to apply the same rationale with smaller bodies as well because hopefully this is coming across that bodies come in literally all shapes and sizes and there can be damage done as well of focusing on health based on a naturally thin body as well someone may really? look quote unquote healthy because they're in a thin body and very much may not be the case. And we've had those instances as well, totally. for sure, as, you know, as a clinic yeah. where, um, you know, people have been very unwell with an eating disorder, but because of the way they look, they're assumed that everything's good. And then Absolutely. they've been found to have electrolyte imbalances, heart issues, all this oh, kind of stuff going on. Or mm -hmm. someone who's using a lot of cocaine and uh, mm -hmm. their weight is low and they're Absolutely. They're yeah. yeah. So, all right, just moving you into the Q&A a bit here. So, um, first question, uh, from one of our attendees as a caregiver of someone with a child that is in recovery from an eating disorder. So first of all, congratulations. That's fantastic. So they write about how you mentioned using language around practicing healthy habits instead of going for weight loss. Now, from this person's experience, which I can absolutely echo, Many with eating disorders latch onto the notion of society that reinforces the thin ideal. So any recommendations on avoiding that, especially in an eating disorder context? Very big question, very difficult question. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, you know, like in other contexts. So, you know, again, I'm in the LGBT community. You know, we get a, a perpetual societal message that, you know, this you know, we're, we're different. So, you know, that's not always a good thing. And I think when we go against the grain of diet culture, it's like that same kind of swimming upstream, mm -hmm. but it's also recognizing that, you know, I'd say, you know, finding your community, you know, there are others out there that are more body neutral or body positive. Um, and also again, you know, learning, doing your research, you know, um, and then coming to your own conclusion and, and kind of a, aligning with your own values. I think that's sort of building that I wish we didn't have to build resilience, but I feel like, you know, unfortunately we, we do in this context because you're right. It is very difficult when we're bombarded with, with diet culture. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's, that's such a great, I mean, you said it way better than me and all I would say sort of uh, practically in agreement with what you would say is like really considering curating social media feeds. And I, if your loved one is a younger person, I mean, life is social media almost. Right. So really hard. TikTok, I feel, is is worse than Instagram. Instagram, there's actually been research to show, you know, there's research to show that the more social media, the worse body image, there is mm -hmm. risk 
So whether it's conversations, you know, but the idea of curating, if you can, so unfollowing things that make you feel worse about yourself, even if they are health promoting, you know, sites, and then trying to follow um, people with of various sizes. I've done that myself, and I actually have found it to be really helpful in trying to chip away at that unconscious bias that I have. But it is a hard, hard thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other Absolutely. thoughts, really, yourself? I, one of the things that comes to mind is just bringing up what uh, Charlotte, you already said, especially uh, maybe as a caregiver, um, as this question was written of someone who are, like has already shown predisposition to an eating disorder, having an eating disorder, um, educating them on the sides of things that they don't see, because we're naturally going to have a confirmation bias to certain things. And by that, I mean, you notice stuff that goes along with the thought. So, you know, think about Instagram algorithms. They show you things based on something you thought somehow. I don't know. Um, so showing the other side. So, you know, if you're going to, all you're going to see is inspiration out there. Educating about actually, you know, the, the truth is there's a lot of people making money behind this. So, of course, they're going to push it. But also showing the things that you're not looking at, like the diversity side. Um, and, and then, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Nope, go ahead. The last thing I was thinking when you talked about, because, you know, when I talked about healthy behaviors, I do want to say, and it's another whole discussion that when I talk about a healthy nutrition or activity behavior, I'm also talking holistically. So what mm -hmm. would be a healthy um, meal pattern for Charlotte, Healy and I could, and food choice could all be different because, you know, we all have different cultural backgrounds, different experiences with food. And so the idea that, you know, when we think about healthy nutrition, we get an idea that's probably not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's spiritually and socially and emotionally psychologically and physically. Yeah. So sort Absolutely. of expanding that definition. Oh. Okay. And another question, which I think is very, I love it. Um, any suggestions on curbing diet talk, weight talk in a work environment? A lot oh. of people bring up pride about losing pounds, totally. how they've done. Um, I mean, we recently ate cake in a meeting and I found that to be a, a very cathartic experience with a lot of this. So like on purpose, ate cake um, at 10 in the morning. So any suggestions on how to manage yeah. this? And I think lunch rooms, depending on, you know, I think sometimes the most toxic lunch rooms I sat in were sort of um, healthcare lunch rooms, you know, where there's mm -hmm. nurses and physios and doctors and dietitians all sitting there. So um, I do think that, you know, changing the conversation, like, is maybe part of trying to change things, and it's really hard. So personally, sometimes I have just tried to change the topic, because it's hard to, it's hard to sort of challenge it in the moment without seeming preachy, or, um, mm -hmm. and maybe it is sort of having a workplace talk, you know, in line with equity, diversity, inclusion, about sort of what's, what are the potential downsides of talking about weight and diet? But it's a tough one. Charlotte, any thoughts? Yeah, I, again, you know, you know, you have to be, I get it. You have to be understanding of the fact that we are bombarded with, with it, you know, and there's a sense of community in this kind of camaraderie of like, we're going to tackle this diet together. You know, you, you know, I think this is why, you know, workplaces do this where it's like, you mm -hmm. know, everybody's going to go on this diet challenge and, and things like that. But, you know, you, you get to choose where you put your energy, you know, and again, you can still have friends at work and socialize with them, but if, if they aren't respecting uh, the fact that, you know, these topics aren't necessarily helpful to you, you know, and you try to change the subject, as Anna said, then, you know, it's okay to sometimes say, you know what, like, I'll catch up with you later and, you know, leaving and going and doing something else you know and or eating somewhere else you know go outside mm -hmm. and sit outside in the sunshine and and obviously not in the middle of winter um but <laughs> you know that kind of thing um but you know I think sometimes our actions speak louder than our words in terms of you know people don't always respect it when we we verbally you know set a boundary so sometimes we have to kind of actually you know move our mm -hmm. bodies away from them um, and that's the same with loved ones as well. You can be validating and, and understand that in their own way, people think that they're trying to help your health and it's also negatively impacting you. So it's okay to say, you know what, like, I love you and, you know, I'm going to leave this situation and come back later. 
and you know until you until we change the topic kind of thing absolutely all right that brings us to 731 which i'm going to call a roaring success for timekeeping given how much there was to talk about so thank you to everyone joining and charlotte thank you so much for all your information and again this will be up on youtube within a week to two weeks or so um, someone did have a question about possibly sending slides out. I just said I would check, and if that was possible, I would have them email it to the registration email. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, keep an eye on your email, and if possible, we will send it out to you. Otherwise, have a great night, and keep an eye out for our next webinar has not been um, announced yet or finalized yet, but keep an eye on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Our, and our website for when uh, that comes out. Thank you. Thank you, take care. Bye, thank you.